blocks a vision. The future of public sector using blockchain technology. Mr. Nick Sabo, blockchain cryptocurrency and smart contracts pioneer, United States. Good morning, uh, Bratislava. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, give a historical perspective on contracts and also talk about the uh, smart contracts and the present and future of those. So when we think about society, um, we can think about it in terms of layers of architecture, starting with the foundation and building up. Or in technological terms, we can think about it as a protocol stack. You have lower layers of the protocol stack, your basic network, um, your foundation, foundational uh, layer, and proceeding up from there. So in terms of society, um, we're going to start with security, because if um, your, your features higher level up can be attacked, then you have a very imperfect system that's often not going to behave the way that you think that the rules say it's supposed to behave. So we're going to talk, start with uh, security, and then we're going to build up to the, to the law level, the level of rules, and uh, consider what, what um, advanced digitalization and smart contracts can bring to that. So without security, there's, there's no law or commerce. And by secure, I mean that, um, minimize vulnerability to outsiders, to insiders, um, any feature, minimize vulnerability of any feature that is desirable in your system that, that could be corrupted. You want to minimize the, the vulnerability to that corruption. And so that's, that's a, a, a very broad kind of definition of security. It's not just locking your front door to prevent a certain kind of attack. It's a very broad definition of security. And with uh, blockchains and smart contracts, we can start applying this much broader um, definition of security. Um, so we should try to secure all the important features, ultimately, of what we're trying to do in life. And so I'm going to go back to s talk about a very ancient historical foundation of this. Um, at the dawn of civilization, um, the Mesopotamian and Indus Valley civilizations here. Um, they had a system of, of securing goods for trade and transport. And it basically started with, they didn't have paper yet, they didn't record things on paper. In fact, they started the system even before the invention of writing. And so they put, would put wet clay around the plug of a jar, the rim of a basket, um, the knot of a rope around a bale, um, so that if it was tamper evident, if you um, tried to get in and get those goods, it would destroy this seal. And they would thoroughly cover the impressions of a seal with a unique seal pattern, which you see here, some examples of that. Um, so, for example, we see the cylinder here, and then this is the resulting seal it makes. Leave that to dry so um, it hardens. And the seal must be broken under proper conditions in a proper ceremony. And these guys mixed up religion and business. So if your seal was broken before the cargo arrived at a destination, destination, that could um, bring you divine retribution in these cultures. And in our modern accounting terms, that means fraud or error ha had occurred if, if the seal was broken. Something you did not want to have happen. Okay, so, and with the dawn of writing and invention of numbers, um, another system of, of tamper-evident numbers appeared up. So on this one side of this clay token, we have a, lists 120 pots of wheat, 90 pots of barley, 55 goats, and on side two is a checksum. Um, it's a total of these, these numbers. So if some of these things go missing during transport or when they're being stored, um, you, can, you can check, and it reduces the probability of an undetected error. It actually slightly can double the probability of an error because you can make an error recording, but it greatly reduces by a factor of a square the probability of an undetected error. And so this could greatly increase the reliability of, of cross-border trade, doing trade with people you don't necessarily trust, and trusting, putting your goods with people you don't necessarily trust. You can trust somebody at the other end who will check this protocol, but you don't have to necessarily trust all the shippers in between. And some modern versions of this, this is a tamper-evident door, seal, 
and this is an evidence bag. And so this evidence bag um, thing, I'll talk about this again later in conjunction with the blockchain, but it's very commonly used police evidence rooms, um, banks for handling checks and, and other paper financial instruments, cash. Um, so trust scales very poorly, unfortunately. That's why we need these kinds of protocols. Um, if you look at the, the uh, cryptocurrency, and in particular the Bitcoin um, ecosystem, almost all the hacks happen on the centralized exchanges that are on the per periphery of the system, the most infamous of these being the, the Mt. Gox hack there. Um, Bitcoin itself has been largely immune to this kind of thing. The only attack that's happened was a small attack um, against what's called the Border Gateway Protocol, which is actually a centralized um, point of control in the internet topology itself. So again, it's actually a problem of centralization caused even the, the uh, small Bitcoin attack. But in general, Bitcoin is, is the most robust, um, secure, and reliable financial system that's ever been developed, for, especially for cross-border um, transfers. It's uh, much easier and cheaper, as a previous speaker mentioned, than trying to do a, a cross-border wire transfer through a series of trusted banks that add their, their uh, rents to the thing. And centralization is insecure. So um, when at the last days of the Tsarist um, Russian uh, Empire, they had centralized a few radio stations, they had centralized newspapers, um, railroad stations, and so as a result, there were only a handful of places in St. Petersburg, uh, which they changed the name to Leningrad after this guy, and uh, Moscow that they had to take over, that the Bolsheviks had to take over, and boom, it was gone. And so that was a very fragile system that was very vulnerable to uh, that kind of takeover. And unfortunately, we're starting to see some of that today with some of our digital services. As central banks go to digital um, systems and they bring naively bring the kind of centralized administration that we've had with digital systems, um, these have become extremely vulnerable to a catastrophic failure of, of this kind or of, of some hacking cyber threat kind. And similarly with our social networks, we're now seeing lots of campaigns of, of censorship going after the CEOs of, uh, if you look at Jack Dorsey, for example's timeline, you'll see an endless amount of people um, trying to get him to censor their political enemies. And so these are single points of failure, the Jack Dorseys and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, um, the CEO of Google, these are single points of failure in our global um, digital ecosystem that are, that are very vulnerable, similarly to the railroad stations and the newspapers um, in Tsarist Russia. So it's very tempting to do this, though, because it makes life simpler when you're trying to think about security. Oh, we'll just trust some authority, and then, we don't, then you don't have to think seriously about security, but of course you're actually leaving a security hole um, when you do that. So when you, if you really want a system like Bitcoin that can be globally seamless, trust minimized, um, you need to minimize your trust assumptions that you're making, minimize your dependence on authorities. So for example, we, the previous talk on proof of authority, if those authorities can collude and are centralized, you really haven't achieved any of the value of blockchain because you're still um, vulnerable to those authorities being subverted or just those authorities making decisions that are contrary to the rules that they promised you. Um, physical wealth traditionally has not been very secure. Um, the Aztecs would collect tribute from their, their tribes in gold. The, the Spanish looted the uh, gold from the Aztecs. Sir Francis Drake over here looted gold from the, the Spanish galleons. Um, in World War II, um, the gold standard had a lot of problems because it was difficult to impossible to ship gold, for example, between England and Canada, and so that destroyed the uh, the uh, workings of the gold, gold standard. And of course, vulnerable to, here's uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a president who confiscated gold from um, Americans during the Great Depression. And again, so a kind of vulnerable um, form of wealth. 
Um, so insecurity drives up costs and get you stuck inside national silos. So our current financial system is heavily dependent politically on that. So if you're using J.P. Morgan and Chase, for example, you're very dependent on United States law enforcement, people who don't speak your language, don't understand your culture, really don't know who you are at all, basically. Um, you're dependent on these people if you're using J.P. Morgan. And even similarly, if you're using Deutsche Bank, for example. So um, it depends on, on government and politics for its security, and not Slovakian government um, and, and politics, but United States, or in the case of Deutsche Bank, German law and politics. So, um, you know, when they get hacked, the first thing they do is call a, a U.S. government agency and try to, try to fix things. Um, now, computational versus social efficiency. So, in the last um, basically almost 100 years, computational costs have been lowering exponentially while our, our brains have been staying about the same size. And so, um, we've got this vast computational surplus that we can use to start to substitute um, human authorities and human functions where we can with uh, computational ones. And I'll get later some comparisons of where we can and cannot do this, or some feel for that anyway. Um, so let's, the, uh, I guess the, the cryptoanic or cypherpunk ideal was to apply computer science to minimize vulnerability to strangers. So we wanted to solve ambitious problems like privatize money, um, there is some history of private money, it's not all just been government controlled. And we wanted to apply computer science to, uh, to create a, a trust-minimized private global money. And nonviolently protect property and enforce, or really, we're, we're really talking about incentivizing or motivating the performance of contracts. And so this is where the idea of smart contracts and blockchains and cryptocurrencies comes from, this, this kind of thinking. Uh, about how to do things that many people have thought were government functions in a new way that, that uh, is more trustworthy and much more socially scalable, globally scalable. And so if we decentralize things per computer science, it's not just any kind of decentralization, it's very specific protocols like Nakamoto consensus used in Bitcoin, um, and automate this, we can take some of the functionality that's currently done by lawyers and investigators and accountants and so forth. And so you can think of a blockchain as a bunch of robots in green eye shade checking up on each other's work. And of course, the previous um, thing had a more in-depth uh, technical uh, explanation of this, but I think this is a good, good metaphor for a high-level understanding of what's going on. And um, societies, going back to society's protocol stack, so that was talking about the security the security layer, which I think blockchains and the associated cryptography are, are very promising in that regard. Um, so now I'm going to talk about rules. I'm going to talk to go the legal um, level, talk about rules and incentives to follow those rules. So. Um, we have highly evolved systems of rules, so competition, a procedure of discovery has produced a lot of battle-tested rules over hundreds of years, countless disputes. So in a sense, we're trying to reverse engineer the law into software code. We're not trying to reinvent everything from scratch, and, or at least I, I think that's a much more promising approach is reverse engineering these rules instead of trying to reinvent everything from scratch. Um, now, architecture and law design patterns, or pattern language was a uh, architectural book, and it inspired design patterns in software. But really, software is still fairly young. So we're at the very, very early stages of, of all this kind of um, ultimately revolutionary uh, technology. And if we look at what we want to reverse engineer, um, I'm focusing on business law here, commercial law. So this is what you do, what we call 1L in the United States, what you learn in the first year of law school. Property law is the oldest, probably the oldest form of law. Uh, contracts, probably the most useful in the modern world, and that's going to be my focus in this talk. Um, secured transactions is related to contracts. It's about hypothecation, collateral liens, that kind of thing. And that also plays a very central role in smart contracts and creating that incentivization. Um, I won't get into corporates 
organizations. There was mention, uh, there was some talk, uh, earlier talk about decentralized autonomous organizations, and that's related to uh, to corporations and uh, constitutional law and civil procedures and evidence um, and adjudication issues. I won't. It, it's important, but I'm not going to get into that either. So why do we want to make contracts? Um, building things or providing services, or if we've got three people who want to agree on the color of our car, um, requires combining diverse people and objects in the value of producing combinations. So this means doing deals. Um, so we want to create this engine. It's going to require expertise from Germany, Czech Republic, Slovakia, you know, many places around the world, um, Japan, um, that expertise goes into making this engine. Um, so why do we make contracts? Alice and Bob want to do a deal. We'll make them both better off. And I've, I've borrowed Alice and Bob from cryptography, which shows kind of the parallels between cryptographic protocols, which create the security layer, including blockchains, and smart contracts, which is a higher level layer that I'm talking about now. But there's a parallel here, so we're, I'm borrowing Alice and Bob from cryptography. Now they're doing smart contracts, or doing here a traditional contract. Even though they may be strategically combative with each other, they may not trust each other very far, they still want to do this deal. And so they need rules, enforceable rules, that they'll both have an incentive to stick to, and they're motivated to follow. Um, so contract law really lies at the heart of our, our system of laws, and it, it is also a place, perhaps not coincidentally, where you can write your own laws. You can write your own contracts for your own deals. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about medieval European, some historical context. I'm not going to go in depth and explain all this. Um, this is a loan, and they had a very creative um, system of doing loans with implicit security because it's explicit or ex explicit interest or implicit interest because explicit interest wasn't allowed. And this is where the first um, shared pool insurance comes from, medieval uh, Italy. And uh, if you add, take a loan contract and add a safe arrival um, clause to it, you can get one of these early insurance contracts. And also, what I haven't shown here, add a pool. And so safe arrival is when the cargo arrives, it's unloaded, you do those, that checking to make sure the cargo is intact. And this is an example. You can actually fit this on one page. Again, it's too much for this presentation, but it shows you that these medieval contracts are very simple, and they actually make a good good models and inspiration for reverse engineering um, insurance and, and loans and other assorted financial instruments. Um, so this is, this is instantiation of that one. Um, so getting to smart contracts, so you can think of a smart contract as, um, imagine a lawyer writing the behavior of a vending machine up. If the party of the first puts in a five cent coin, the four said party gets a soda, if they put in a 10 cent coin, they get a, um, a soda. If they put in a 25 cent coin, they get back a soda and a 5 cent coin and a 10 cent coin. And this would be very tedious, right? So you put this in the machine. But since our software capabilities and our code are getting more and more better, we, ha we can put a lot more of this, what we think of now as legal code, into the machine, um, into a vending machine like, like things which I call smart contracts. OK, so the security protocol changes control over things. Um, at the basis, again, is a security protocol. It changes control over assets, conditional on states of the world, and conditional on performance. So you put in your coins, again, this old-fashioned machine. It, it uh, verifies your performance. It verifies you put a coin in. And then it automates the return performance um, states of the world. Um, so it can, a smart contract can verify performance. It'll be doing that often. And sometimes it also automates performance. And it makes some kinds of performance conditional on others, just as a, as a legal contract would do. Um, so what do smart contracts buy you? They can save you mental transaction costs. There's contracts like contracts for difference that really aren't possible without computers. You want computers to constantly update the price for you. Um, there's algorithmic management, where um, it's a version or a variation or extension of an employment contract, where a large number of people are con conducting a large number of object objectively measurable tasks. 
um, especially things like logistics of space and time requirements. Um, and because smart contracts are more predictable, that makes them simpler. And probably the biggest thing right now is the cost of trust and security, again, especially in cross-border situations. And because the ambiguity of, of wet code can lead to injustice, which I will talk about a little bit more, um, smart contracts are not just dApps. Um, an Ethereum contract, what Ethereum calls a contract, is just one important piece of this. It's on the blockchain. It's the trust-minimized part. But there's also user interfaces for search and negotiation and performance monitoring. And there's also performance verification, which typically involves some offline things. If you're transferring cryptocurrency, that can be done online. Um, but quite often, you're interested in off-chain performances like a logistical delivery. And so the phases, um, search, an Uber app matching drivers and riders, eBay matching buyers or sellers, most of the internet innovation has come in the search phase of, of making deals. Um, negotiations, Uber app has a price algorithm, eBay has its auction, um, and this is where the contract is formed, the, the agreement's formed. And then performance, um, Uber has an app that tells the driver or map tells the driver where to go, um, you pay by credit card, um, eBay has PayPal, as actually performance is a weak part. So performance is typically in the weak part so far. And so the focus of, of my work on smart contracts, and I think a big opportunity for innovation in the future, is going to focus on the performance phase. And then um, we also seize our free collateral to create this motivation. There's reputation systems such as Yelp. And of course, you can go back to the old-fashioned uh, lawsuits if, if necessary, but that, that's far more expensive. Um, so smart contracts proper can be negotiated. Um, my company is working on um, ways to negotiate and then translate that into the blockchain. So we're negotiating a forward financial contract, and then this compiles or translates onto the blockchain, um, where it can then run in a trust-minimized manner. Um, and these are the states of performance. Again, our focus is on performance phases. It can be form, performing, et cetera. And each of these stages, the collateral is managed uh, appropriately. And so some of the relationship between smart contracts and traditional law, um, there's a lot of confusion about this. So the most basic way to think of it is a smart contract is kind of like a repo man. It's a security protocol that controls the burden of lawsuit. It changes control over assets. A proper smart contract has the control over the assets. It changes control over the assets, conditional to performance as it has verified. And um, so it controls the burden of lawsuit. If you, wanna, if you think the smart contract produced something wrong, um, then you go back to the traditional legal system and conduct a lawsuit. But that's, that's a lot, lot more expensive. And so possession is nine-tenths of law today, then a smart contract's maybe 99% of law in the future. Um, and smart contracts are also a security philosophy. It makes security protocols correspond to the actual rights and obligations people expect. Right now, we have this hyper-simplified um, central administration that, uh, of computers that doesn't correspond much at all to the rights and obligations that people are promised. And as a result, we have this huge mismatch. We have expectations that are destroyed, and we have these single points of failure that, that make our current centralized digital systems very vulnerable. Um, so now we're at the very beginnings of this, so, and these are two very different systems, so really they're complementary at this point. Um, law grounds on subjective minds and analogy, and uh, software and Boolean logic in bits. Um, you have the traditional um, violence-based government uh, contempt and imprisonment are your ultimate um, redresses for motivating people to follow the law. And you have uh, replication and cryptography and other, other nonviolent security protocols and software. Um, law is very flexible. It's highly evolved in many cases. Um, software is very rigid. That makes it more predictable, but also less subject to change if, if something goes wrong. Which it might, because again, this is, we have less much less experience in software than with traditional law. Um, law is confined into jurisdictional silos. Um, if you want to get outside your jurisdictional silo, all of a sudden um, you have to trust somebody in Germany or France um, or some other EU country, um, rather than who don't speak your language and might conduct the the trial court in a different language from yours. Um, or they might try to translate language, which is even worse and produce a total mess um, when it comes to law. 
So um, software is on the blockchain. It's independent from financial political institutions if it's on one of these public blockchains like um, Bitcoin or to some extent Ethereum and seamless operation across borders. Um, lawsuits are very expensive. The costs of software are typically very, very low. And this despite the fact that we do all these so-called wasteful things like proof of work. Even after you account for all the electricity and, and all that stuff, the, the costs of this are still vastly lower than, than the costs of, of commercial lawsuits. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about financial contracts, dispute mediation, pool and assurance contracts, and I'm going to skip over smart property. That, that's an interesting future thing. Um, so we can do collateralized versions of loans, bonds, futures options. Right now, the collateral, the trust mineralized collateral is on-chain stuff like tokens and other cryptocurrencies. And the future is blockchains control more off-chain assets than those can be useful as, as collateral as well for smart contracts. So this is an example of future. And this is the same language I used to reverse engineer those medieval contracts. So uh, it, it's very helpful to uh, just go to an old um, simple contract, you know, a one or two page contract, but nevertheless fairly complete, and uh, reverse engineer it into a formal, formal language. That's a very, very helpful exercise to go through, go through those exercises. An American option. Um, now, a previous talk talked about decentralized autonomous organizations, the basic core of that and the core of a bunch of other things you can do with blockchains are these pools of, of money and rules that control who can access the pools of money under what conditions funds get put in or released um, and so forth. <clears throat> 